I discovered poetry, like a lot of people do, at a time of great need in my life. I was eight years old, and my parents had sent me to boarding school. And that strange British habit of sending a child to the other side of the country, to a place where no one loved them. I was small, I was lonely, and I was scared, and I was short of friends. But I found one thing that the school seemed to think I could do well, and that was reading poetry. And poetry became my friend. And as I grew older and went to secondary school, I continued to read poetry and started to learn poems off by heart, just as a thing to do, a way of passing the time, filling the boredom that used to exist in the pre-internet world. When I was 23, I was about to cross the Cromwell Road, a busy three-lane or six-lane highway in London. And as the lights turned red, the man standing next to me stepped into the road. But a car decided to jump the lights. I, I can still hear and see just exactly what happened. It was the most disturbing thing that ever happened to me as I saw this body flying in the air and landing on the tarmac. Luckily, in the crowd next to me was a first aider, and he grabbed me by the elbow and amazingly managed to get this man who had no pulse back to life again. His heart was beating. Moments later, an ambulance came. He was gone. The police took my statement, and I was back standing where I had begun by the red light, with the only evidence of this extraordinary traumatic event being the blood that was on my hands. Luckily, I'd been learning a poem by Philip Larkin called Ambulances, and it's about that moment when you see an ambulance pull up on your street to take one of your neighbors away for possibly the very final time. And you sense the solving emptiness that lies just under everything we do. And for a moment, get it whole, so permanent and blank and true. The fastened doors recede. Poor soul, you whisper, at your own distress. For born away in deadened air may go the sudden shut of loss round something nearly at an end. The random blend of families and fashions there at last begins to loosen. Inside a room the traffic parts to let go by, brings closer what is left to come, and dulls to distance all we are. Now those words, and the rather large gin and tonic I bought in the pub, help me process what, I, as I said, had been the most disturbing event that had ever happened in my life. And I realized in retrospect, that that was the first time the poetry pharmacy had come in my life. I was, as they'd say in the modern parlance, self-medicating with poetry. Years later, I started my own publishing business, and then the forward prizes for poetry. And finally, after that, National Poetry Day. And I've spent a lifetime trying to get poetry out of Poetry Corner, and maybe made the corner a teeny bit bigger. Then the Olympics came. I, I don't know whether you, any of you saw the Olympics in 2012 in London, but the Olympic Park was strangely like a little piece of Dubai nestling in East London. Everything was new. It didn't really have a sense of place. And uh, I read that the Arts Council were paying for islands to be dragged around Cornwall, all kinds of strange artistic events, but there'd been no place for poetry in the Olympics. And for those of you who know the original Olympics invented by the ancient Greeks, they had two stadia, one for the athletes 
and one for the poets. Now, I wasn't going to be able to persuade the British Olympic authorities to build a stadium for the poets, but I was at least able to persuade them to fill the uh, Olympic Park with poetry. And what was so interesting is that we commissioned some of the nation's greatest poets, and the poetry that they wrote was all about what had been there before. The British Boys Boxing Club, the Brant and Mary May Match Factory. Poetry is all about continuity. And we did a competition with the BBC on what piece of poetry should be on the athlete's wall, the wall that um, sat between the Olympic Village and the stadio where all the athletic events were performed. And we chose the last lines of Tennyson's poem, Ulysses, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. And with that, I made a little anthology with Faber and Faber of inspiring poems for the Olympics. And I did, as writers do, I, I got on the road and I started taking this book to festivals and so forth. And one day, a grand friend of mine called Jenny Dyson said, I am programming a literary festival in Cornwall, Port Elliot. You're always sending poetry to cheer me up at difficult times. So I'm setting you up to be interviewed, but afterwards, I'm putting you in a tent with two armchairs and I'm making you a prescription pad. I've designed it for you and you're going to listen to people's problems. Bring photocopies of every poem you can think of that might help them. And uh, I thought, okay. And I turned up with my sack full of poetry and I sat in my tent thinking, I'll be there for an hour or two. Six hours later, with a very, very full bladder, I popped my head outside the tent and saw the blackboard was full. And I was booked not just for the rest of the day, but for the day after as well. And my poetry pharmacy had begun. A week later, I got a telephone call from the BBC asking me if I'd go on Radio 4 on their Saturday morning uh, magazine show. And um, as the program developed, the producer looked at me wide-eyed and said, I've never received so many emails for this program before. People wanted prescriptions for every kind of anxiety. And um, they said, would you come back at Christmas? Because I know how challenging Christmas can be for lots of people. And that I did. And um, then one day, I found myself sitting next to uh, a woman um, uh, at a dinner table in London. And I was puffing away on my vape. And she said to me, God, I need one of those, because I've taken up smoking again. And perhaps inappropriately, definitely inappropriately, because I probably had a drink or two, I said, why? Because you hate your husband. And she grabbed me by the arm and said, how did you know? I said, I'm so sorry. I've been listening to people's problems all day. And, um, and I think I'm just acutely sensitive to this. And she said, are you a shrink? I said, no, no, but this is what I do, and I, and I do it with poems. And she said, oh, my God, there's a book in this. And um, so that's how my journey continued. I was asked then by the British government if I would do a review of the public library system in the UK. And I decided as I began that I would not want to turn up as the government inspector in library after library. So I offered to do a pharmacy in every library I visited. And over a two year period, I listened to over a thousand people's problems in all parts of Britain. And I learned something absolutely extraordinary in this humbling experience. First of all, that people were prepared to open their heart to a complete stranger. But secondly, whether I was in the mental health unit in Liverpool or in leafy Kensington in a library, we all have the same problems. And rather like a doctor, though I don't claim to be one, who will tell you that in their waiting room all week, they get pretty much the same things over and over again. Our problems on the whole can be reduced to pretty much the same small group of anxieties. And that's what I've spent my time trying to find prescriptions for. And do you know what the biggest anxiety is of all? Loneliness. Isn't that strange? We live in a world where we have more platforms to communicate to each other than ever before, but we're lonelier than we've ever been. And why? Because of this. You know it and I know it. But what was so startling talking to everybody around the country was how damaging and dangerous this device has become. 
People are living in a world of social media where they're not putting their real selves up on it. They're putting a kind of avatar. Nobody's really saying on social media, I'm lonely, I'm miserable, I need a friend, I need a hug. This is full of likes and parties and holidays and everything you'd like the world to think you as being, but you know full well it's not you. And yet, strangely, you're incapable of seeing through everybody else. I found two lines of poetry written 700 years ago by a Persian poet from Shiraz called Hafiz, which is my prescription for loneliness. I wish I could show you when you're lonely or in darkness the astonishing light of your own being. And I print it out and I give it to people. I say, learn it off by heart. Stick it on your mirror. And last year I got the most moving email from a lady who said, you won't remember me, but I came to one of your pharmacies and last night I came home to my flat and it had been burgled. And in that shocking way in which burglars behave, my flat had been completely ransacked. Those two lines of poetry were still on my mirror. They were the only things that hadn't moved. Thank you, she said. It got me through the night. As well as loneliness, perhaps the other big issue that comes my way is lack of courage. We're all so full of fear and needing a little bit of impetus. And one of my favorite prescriptions that I discovered came from a French poet, Apollinaire, adapted by an English poet who died last year, Christopher Logue, who was private eyes E.J. Thrib, amongst other guises. And it goes like this. Come to the edge. It's too high. Come to the edge. I'm too scared. Come to the edge. And they came, and they pushed, and they flew. We live in an increasingly secular society. We don't commune in the way we used to. But I'm increasingly aware that the canon of poetry is becoming the secular liturgy. It's something that we are sharing with each other via social media. It's why poetry book sales are booming every year. And it's our way of holding hands with each other. It's our way of connecting. And it's our way of giving a genuine sense of continuity with the past. Life is so frenzied and so frazzled there's something incredibly reassuring to find somebody expressing how you feel rather more elegantly than you can express yourself. And when you discover it was written 700 years ago, you realize you're not alone. You're not mad. That people have always felt like this. And it normalizes the difficulties and anxieties that are going through your mind. The other day, I was doing a poetry pharmacy in London. And I was, it was in a sort of co-working place, and I was uh, doing sessions with people working there. And halfway through, the security guard came in and said to me, your 3.30's cancelled. I said, fine, that's OK. And then he said, can I take their place? Of course, I said, please. Come and sit down. What's on your mind, I said. He said, I'm 31. When I was 23, I came out. But I still haven't had a relationship yet. That's really sad, I said. What do you think that's about? He said, I think it's because 
although I'm a kind person and a loving person and I would be great company and I would be supportive, I'm Muslim and I'm gay and I don't believe I can be both. I said, I think you've got that wrong. If we go back to that extraordinary poet, Hafez, 700 years ago, the greatest Sufi mystic of his time, he wrote, it happens all the time in heaven, and one day it will happen again on earth, that men and women who are married, and men and men who are lovers, and women and women who give each other life, will get down on bended knee with tears in their eye and say to their loved one, my dear, how can I be more loving to you? My darling, how can I be more kind? He got out of his chair, tears streaming down his cheeks, and gave me a big bear hug. Now he's dating. There is, without doubt, something utterly compelling about the power of poetry. And I have to say, when I'm lucky enough to be a cipher, to find something like that, to give to somebody in that situation, and to see them get out of the chair seemingly a foot taller, I feel very blessed. I think what also I find so extraordinary and so reassuring is how these words have passed through the centuries and how, in a way, our lives and our difficulties are fundamentally always the same. So what I'd be here to tell you today is a sense that, in my belief, Poetry can save your life. I believe there's a, a poem for every single human anxiety ever created. There are many, many of them. And if you find that poem, just like uh, Alan Bennett put it, it's as though a hand has come out and taken yours. And that is an extraordinary, extraordinary blessing. Thank you.